Hello, I am Dr. Lawrence Smith, Dean of the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. Thank you for tuning in to Well Said. In a culture of community, scholarship, and innovation, the Zucker School of Medicine is dedicated to transforming students into doctors who will improve healthcare, inspire change, and better the lives of the people they serve. It is why we are pleased to collaborate with WRHU, Radio Hofstra University, to bring you a program committed to sharing expert discussion and insight on health and wellness topics important to you. Join us today and each week for a recommended dose of Well Said with your host, Dr. Ira Nash. I'm Dr. Ira Nash. Welcome to Well Said. Today, we'll be discussing the relatively new field of lifestyle medicine. We'll discuss what lifestyle medicine is and how it might impact patients and healthcare delivery. My guest is my colleague, Dr. Hugo Ortega. Dr. Ortega is an internal medicine fellow at Northall Health and is taking the lead in developing a lifestyle medicine program. And I'm delighted it brings him to our show today. Uh, Hugo, welcome to Well Said. Thank you so much for having me today. We're at the uh, two year mark for an extraordinary period of time in the history of our country and the history of medicine. How have you been holding up through the pandemic? Honestly, I've been I've been doing pretty good. You know, I think in general, as long as you're busy or doing things that you're, that interest of you, it makes it more bearable. Um, but it's definitely gotten easier as like most of the, you know, caution and the lockdowns have eased up. So let's get into our conversation about lifestyle medicine. And, and I always like to start these conversations at the very beginning. So how would you define lifestyle medicine? What does it encompass? So lifestyle medicine is essentially the practice of evidence-based medicine, uh, including lifestyle modifications or interventions in what uh, the American College calls uh, the six domains of a healthy lifestyle. The six domains themselves are uh, diet, uh, which is usually like a whole food plant-based diet or as close to it as possible. Uh, physical activity, sleep, stress management, social connectedness, and avoiding risky substances. Uh, You know, it sounds pretty straightforward because realistically it kind of is. It's like these are the things you should do to be healthy. But it honestly includes a lot of topics that I feel most medical students and residents just don't really get enough education in, right? The classic example for that would be nutrition education, right? Back in the 1980s, the National Academy of Sciences was like, hey, you know, medical students should get 25 hours of nutrition education. And there's been multiple studies, one in 2008, one in 2010, one in 2015, that have showed that almost that most of the medical schools do not meet that, right? The 2015 study actually said, I believe, 71% of medical schools do not meet the benchmark for 25 hours of education. Yeah. So it continues to be a problem. So that's interesting. So we have, uh, I just want to repeat those six domains because I think we're going to be coming back to them perhaps one by one. But you mentioned diet, activity, sleep, stress management, social connections, and then substance avoidance was the last one. So I'm curious what the history of this is. How did, um, how did this kind of coalesce as a, as a separate discipline? You know, lifestyle medicine, like the term, has been around for a while. You know, if you look at like tags in PubMed and other, you know, research databases, you can see that there are thousands and thousands of research articles with the titles and tags of lifestyle medicine. But the sort of field and like thing as a whole really coalesced in 2004 under the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So they, the, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine was founded in 2004 with the goal is to create like a rigorous set of standards, values, beliefs to help drive this field forward. Um, it's something that, like you said, it's relatively new in that sense, but it has grown tremendously in the last few years. Uh, don't quote me on the numbers, but I believe it's been like about a 500% increase in the last few years in terms of the number of people who are getting certified, the number of programs that are starting to teach lifestyle medicine and things like that. So I would say it's something that maybe we've, we're finally moving past the early adopter phase of the innovation curve and starting to move into the early majority. So it, we're at an exciting time for lifestyle medicine. I'm looking back at the list. I wrote it down as you went through those six items. As you know, and I think as many of our listeners know, I'm a cardiologist and I still 
practice cardiology. And I, I'd like to think that I spend a fair amount of the time that I have with my patients talking about many of these things, about how their lifestyle choices uh, have an impact on their risk of developing heart disease or their prognosis once they have heart disease. So does that make me a lifestyle medicine doctor? How is the practice of lifestyle medicine different from my talking to my patients about their lifestyle? I think that there really isn't the biggest difference there. Essentially, I think if there was a couple of extra steps to make the lifestyle interventions be focused of the conversations rather than, you know, the, the medications and other things, then that would be more considered lifestyle medicine. But, like, realistically, one of the most um, represented specialties in lifestyle medicine are cardiologists. Cardiologists in general have known for a very long time that lifestyle interventions can reduce, reverse, and even prevent um, heart disease. Right, um, you know, there's the there's like the the pivotal work from uh, Dr. Esselton in like preventing and reversing heart disease. Right, mm -hmm. um, the first time I learned about lifestyle medicine was um, through uh, Dr. Osfeld at Montefiore. Right, so cardiologists really have sort of taken this and run with it. Um, but I think really the main thing is shifting that focus. Right. It be, the the main point of the visit becomes, hey, what can we do to increase your your healthy lifestyle, right? And it would be targeting one of the six domains. It's like, okay, so, you know, how how is your diet? What can we do? You know, how much salt are you taking in a day? How can we reduce that amount to like a, you know, a healthier 1,500 or 1,000 milligrams a day? Sort of things like that. Yeah, it strikes me as you're, as you're describing this that I'm going to put this out there and would ask you to see if you agree with how I'm thinking about this, but it sounds a little bit like when people speak about palliative care, where, you know, the palliative care doctors would say that their focus is on improving people's quality of life and reducing suffering. And a lot of doctors would hear that and say, well, isn't that what all doctors do? We're all interested in reducing suffering and improving the quality of life, but it's a difference in focus and making that the primary aspect of the encounter as opposed to something secondary uh, or, or incident to other more intensive treatments. Did, am I on the right track here? Yeah, no, that's a perfect way to put it, right? Because yes, as doctors, we like to think that we do everything we can for our patients. But unfortunately, because of the way, you know, insurance works and finances work, we do not get enough time in general to talk to a patient, right? You know, say you have to talk to your patient about one medical condition, you have to talk about altering their medications, you have to talk about, you know, barriers and like specialties to follow up with. All these things take up way more than just the 15 minutes we're usually granted for a patient visit. And so honestly, some things get put to the wayside. Um, and so by making sort of these sort of specialized visits to just talk about this one aspect, you then grant it the time it needs, right? Like to talk about diet in a comprehensive way takes a long time. To talk about someone's um, sleep and to like intervene on it in a way that works for the patient takes a long time. And so shifting the focus grants us this um, time to really address it and I guess technically you should still deal with the other things, but that's why you can have multiple visits with someone. Interesting. So we talked a little bit about how cardiologists have been engaged in this for some time with the idea that lots of forms of heart disease can be improved or prevented through lifestyle changes. What other kinds of diseases uh, can be prevented or have their prognosis improved through these kinds of lifestyle focused interventions? So there's a lot of things that can be improved and even reversed um, with the lifestyle medicine, right? The One of the, the classic examples we think of is diabetes. Diabetes is usually uh, considered a disease of, like, uh, of lifestyle, right? Meaning that if you live an unhealthy lifestyle, you're at increased risk for developing diabetes and eventually having all the complications. But the good news is just like it, be, it becomes something that you develop in, from having an unhealthy lifestyle. If you then live a healthy lifestyle, there's a chance that it could be cured, right? We've known that diabetes itself can be reversed um, for a long time 
and usually it was in the setting of bariatric surgery. But even in 2009, the American Diabetes Association came out with the definition for diabetes remission, right? Like they're like, hey, someone can cure their diabetes, right? And at first we thought it was only from bariatric surgery, but we've come to learn that something as simple as losing 10% of your weight can sometimes cure diabetes or simply switching to a whole food plant-based diet can um, cure diabetes. Other things that we know that can be reversed are things like heart disease, right? I believe on the, if you look at the back of the Preventing and Reversing Heart Disease book by Dr. Um, Esselton, that you see a 90% stenosed artery in 1996, and then it shows an after picture when someone switched to a healthy lifestyle, and you can see that the um, artery opened up on its own, even without stenting. Um, in addition, there's other things, right? Hypertension we know can be reversed with healthy lifestyle. We've known that as early as the 1940s, right? Because there was the um, Dr. Kempner, I believe, was the was the doctor that did the rice and fruit diet under like you know laboratory conditions, and he was able to cure hypertensive emergency simply by putting someone on a healthy diet for a week or two. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of things that could be worked on for this. Yeah, and just to be clear, when we're talking about diabetes, we're talking about type two diabetes. Just... Correct. So type so... one diabetes can be improve right mm -hmm. and so like insulin requirements and stuff can be reduced uh, but it's it's still technically something that will need medication yeah so you know it seems to me that all of these things that you're talking about and i guess lifestyle by definition comes down to choices that people make about what they eat how active they are how they behave behavior modification is a tough nut to crack i think any Buddy who's tried to change their own diet, let alone uh, convince somebody else to change their diet, has uh, probably been somewhat frustrated in their attempts to do that. So do you have a, uh, a bag of tricks or a box of tools that you use to help people make these changes? Because some of these are going to be tough. Realistically, um, you're correct, right? It's very tough. Like, I think... I, I would like to think that I could tell who has motivation, but that's not true, right? There's people who I've talked to who seemed very unenthusiastic about making the behavioral change, and then I see them three months later, and they've, like, completely changed just by looking into it on their own and then really buying into the philosophy and going for it. And then there are people who seem really, you know, motivated in the office, and then I see them back a month later, and they haven't done anything, right? And so I, I, I think the the main thing that we really focus on when we're doing a lifestyle medicine approach is really empowering the patient to to make the choices for themselves, right? Um, in general, you know, when we think of people being ready to change, we think of them in the trans-theoretical stages of change model, right, where they, they might be pre-contemplated, they might be contemplative, they might be ready, or they might be planning and changing, right? And our job really is to help people move along that spectrum, right? If people have never heard about it, we want to teach them about it. If people are ambivalent about changing we want to help push the needle so they become more ready to change and one of the main techniques that work for that kind of thing is motivational interview just like for any other um, change uh, right by helping them to sort of work out the pros and cons in their head and by helping them sort of learn about the dissonance that is created from their unhealthy choices they're more likely to want to change how successful are you in actually getting people to move along that spectrum and make some of these important changes in their lifestyle? I would say in general, uh, it depends, right? For big overarching changes, like I want you to switch to, you know, a whole food plant-based diet, something that drastic, you know, the, the percent success rate is maybe like 30%, right? But when it comes to small baby step changes, like, hey, I want you to increase the number of fruits and vegetables you're eating, or, hey, I want you to add some flax seeds to your diet to help with the constipation and also help with your blood pressure. I find those things I have, a, like, success rate more towards the 70s or 80s, right? When you tell people, it's like, when you tell people, hey, I can help get you off medications and I can help you, um, you know, not have to come see me so often, <laughs> right? People are well, usually pretty better, open right? to that idea. Yeah, and to yeah. feel better. And so usually the small steps, are much more successful than big steps. But sometimes people really just want to 
do it, you know, 100% and just dive in. And I am totally for that. Right. And, and I think that's, that's probably a general observation as well, that some of this can be overwhelming. I mean, I find in my own practice that if I ask people to do too many things all at once, it becomes overwhelming, seems impossible, and they don't get anything done. But if we say, okay, you know, don't, don't worry about this and this just yet, let's concentrate on improving your, say, physical activity, and, and we'll tackle your smoking and your, your diet some other time, that tends to be helpful as well. Is that something you find to be the case? Yeah, exactly. Right. I, I, I'm a firm believer of the brief action plan model, which was a model I was taught in, in Hofstra as a medical student, where you essentially ask them, hey, what do you want to change about your health in the next two weeks? Right. Then they give us something that they want to change. And then we help them out. Right. We help them come up with a solid plan for that change that they want to do. And we gauge their confidence. And then we try to increase that confidence by mitigating barriers and like promoting support. Right. And I find that usually if the patient comes up with a plan for change, they're much more likely to succeed in doing it because it's their idea. Right. I didn't tell them, Hey, you know, you should quit smoking. They're like, you know what? I kind of want to quit smoking. Maybe I want to like drop my, my cigarette usage by for like five cigarettes a day. And then we come up with a plan for how to do it. Yeah, you know, I want to go back to the, the list of things that you mentioned at the top of the show. And, and one of them kind of stuck out in my mind as being less obviously tied to health than the others. And that's the, the social connections. I mean, I think most people understand that if you smoke cigarettes or uh, are completely inactive, I, most people have gotten the message that that's not good for you. But I wonder if you can speak more specifically to the connection between social connectedness and health. Social connections is very important, and it's often something we never think about um, or talk about because, you know, that normally falls under the category of what we consider a social history. And in general, our social history tends to focus on, like, sex and drug use and, you know, alcohol use and smoking. Right. But the other things that are important to someone's social life, right, their um, spirituality, their religion, their community, their neighborhood, um, their friends and family and their, you know, relationships. Right. Those things are usually not things we ask about. Um, and you can tell that it's very important to someone's health because in this time of the, the, the current pandemic, you can see how much harm uh, people have suffered just from being isolated from being in the lockdowns, right? The people losing their social circle, you know, l led to like increased rates of burnout, increased rates of suicide, increased rates of depression, right? Humans in general are social beings and we really do need these connections. And just like anything else, we can be taught how to maintain and keep these connections alive, right? And one of the things that we as doctors should help teach patients our communication skills, right? We're taught communication skills as students so that we can better work with our patients, right? But how often does those communication skills we use on our patients come up in our regular daily life with other people? Right? I would say that's pretty often, right? Like I mm -hmm. inadvertently end up using my communication skills with a lot of friends and family, right? Sure. And it makes a lot of situations way better than if I didn't use these skills. And so why can't we teach our patients these skills? Um, and so that's one of the things that we should probably put a higher emphasis on, especially now. Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, one of the other things that comes to mind as we're speaking about these sort of non-traditional prescriptions, if you will, right? We're not talking about handing somebody a pill, we're talking about handing them advice and life skills. Can you quantify the, the relative impact of these kinds of things against what I'll call more traditional medical uh, intervention. So if we're talking about, let's say, the, the treatment of high blood pressure or, or type 2 diabetes. Which of these is, is more important? And, and I'm not saying you can't do both, but I'm just try, trying to understand the relative impact of, say, traditional medications versus attention to these lifestyle issues. 
people tend to believe very strongly in medications and, you know, like traditional Western medicine. It's like, you know, I'm going to go to the doctor, they're going to give me something and it's going to fix me. Right. Right. Um, But just as you know, for every like major chronic disease, one of the first guideline recommendations is always lifestyle intervention. Yet that is something that is often shirked. Um, You asked about blood pressure and diabetes And so let's give some numbers for that, right? So I know for blood pressure, for example, um, one lifestyle intervention that can help is um, increasing the amount of flax seeds in your diet, right? Uh, Flax seeds have a whole host of benefits, right? They have a lot of fiber, so they help keep you regular, right? They have lignans, which can help reduce the risk for breast cancer, right? But in addition, they also have a pretty strong antihypertensive effect, right? There was a study published in 2013 in the Hypertension Journal um, as part of the AMA where they um, did a study on over 100 patients. They did, they gave them uh, 30 grams of flax seeds a day, watched them for a month, and then see what their um, pressure was. Obviously, it was randomized control. They did like a control group and everything to compare. And on average, the people with high blood pressures, more than 140 over 90, their average systolic blood pressure drop was 15 points, just without any other changes, just by adding flax seeds to their diet, which if you look at the research for other, you know, blood pressure medicines is comparable, if not even slightly better, right? Um, so so let, me, let, me push, yeah. let me just push back on that a little bit, because to me, that's kind of not so much a lifestyle change as it is a, a substitution of one kind of medicine for another. But I'm talking about things that people change in their lifestyle. Um, so they sleep better, they're more active, they do stress reduction, they improve their social connections and so on. What's the data there relative to a, a more a traditional interventionalist approach to chronic illness management uh, about relative efficacy? Thank you for clarifying that. So, so yeah, so then let's, let's switch for diabetes because that one has um, – decent like interventions that are specifically lifestyle focused, right? There's this um, program known nationally as like the diabetes prevention program um, that they've done studies on the, you know, thousands of patients that are participated in it, participated in it and um, comparable to something like metformin, right? For people with prediabetes, the lifestyle interventions of the diabetes prevention program dropped, it had a 58% reduction in the progression to diabetes, which was more so than the, um, than the metformin group, right? So a, a medication for diabetes that we know works well, metformin, performed, it still helped, but it wasn't as good as just straight-up lifestyle intervention um, mm. and modifications. So, so there is evidence like that. For the high blood pressure, we know that people who decrease their um, sodium intake to 1,500 milligrams or less have, um, can also lead to a systolic blood pressure drop just by making that one um, change in their lifestyle. So, so things like that. So there is, there is decent data on different chronic diseases. And to what extent do you think the challenge is getting patients on board or getting doctors on board? Because I, I, I can imagine in some ways, you know, it, from the physician's perspective, it's easier to write a prescription than it is to spend a lot of time talking to people about changes they need to make in their lifestyle. No, yeah, I think you're completely on, on, on the ball with that one, right? The One of the major barriers for these kind of interventions are the time commitment, right? It is very easy for me to say, hey, I'm going to give you, you know, some amlodipine for your blood pressure than it is to say, hey, how about we talk about your, your salt intake? I want you to create a food diary. I want you to tell me how much salt you're adding to your meals. I'm going to have you come back. We're going to see how we can decrease it and come up with a plan for that, right? Um, that's one of the barriers to it. Another barrier to it simply is just the culture, right? The, the culture of medicine is more so – Um, sick care, right? Like we care for people who are sick and we do a lot more Mm -hmm. secondary and tertiary prevention than primary prevention, right? Because of the way the insurance models and the healthcare models work, we get paid for things we do more so than we get paid to prevent things from happening. And because of that, that's sort of where all the resources go, which sucks. But 
but yeah, so it is something that hopefully over time will change, but it is, it is definitely something that is a barrier to the more widespread into, um, implementation of medicine, of lifestyle. Well, you know, I, I guess it also speaks to what we we're talking about at the uh, earlier in our conversation, that it's kind of the justification in a way for having practitioners who concentrate in this arena having those conversations because it may not be a conversation that the average fill-in-the-blank internist, cardiologist, uh, gastroenterologist, what have you, has the time or inclination to have. I think in general, really, for these sort of, for this sort of focus change and for these sort of cultural changes, right, not just in healthcare, but in the greater, like, American culture, it really comes down to education, right? Like, you need to mm-hmm. catch people and teach people when they're younger so they can really um, integrate those ideas and values into themselves, yes. right? And yeah. so for, like, medical school, like, teaching these things earlier would help them um, make sure to integrate it during their training years and then during their practice years, and then they would teach it to the next generation and so on and so forth. And so I think, in general, education is one of the best ways to sort of combat these, you know, more antiquated um, beliefs that we have in healthcare. Well, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned educating earlier in life. When, when you said that, I my immediately went to, well, educating the public earlier in life about the value of these things. So teaching children about the value of activity and stress management and uh, some of the other things we've talked about. To what extent do you see that there's a, an important role for incorporating the principles of lifestyle medicine into primary school education? I think there's a huge role there, right? And honestly, I think that's probably one of the places where we can make the biggest changes in the long term. You know, the thing the, the thing that I usually think about is, in, in general, there's a lot of things that are taught in schools just to be taught, right? Um, but there's not usually a lot of, like, improving your your life sort of courses right Mm -hmm. uh you know a lot of a lot of kids always complain about how they're not taught to do like taxes or how they're taught to like cook and do things like that right but just as simple as like shifting um one class of math to shifting a class to hey how can we be healthier and how can we live healthier lives like these small changes um and these like implementation of lifestyle programs in the in the early school um, years can really make a huge change because not because um, that will then empower the kids and then the kids can also help make changes in the household because if a kid comes with enthusiasm and tells their parents hey you know I've heard about this um, change that we can make to our diet to really become healthier um, so that you can live longer and that we can have a healthier life right it's going to be harder for the parents to, to not to not to ignore that and try not to change and it strikes me that when we do teach, health-related subjects in school, it's often at a time in the student's life that a lot of these habits are already, pardon the pun, are already baked in. And we should probably be doing this much younger, right? I mean, most kids take some health-related course when they're either in like middle school or high school. But it seems to me that we, we should be talking about this in preschool. Yeah, honestly, I, I think I think in general, we don't give kids enough credit for how much they can learn and integrate into their life. Um, and we tend to really just baby them with the education and say, here, the, these are things you just need to learn to learn them, rather than say, hey, here are things that will be useful to you for the rest of your life. Do what you will with it. Um, and so I do think that we can definitely give our kids uh, more responsibility in in taking charge of their own health and their life early on. Uh, As we uh, get closer to the end of our time together, I just want to shift gears a little bit. And uh, we've been talking mostly about integrating the principles of lifestyle medicine into the care of people who are um, not acutely ill, right? They're, They're people who either have a uh, chronic illness, or they they want to uh, prevent uh, the onset of illness. Do the principles of lifestyle medicine have a role in the care of acutely ill patients? Yes, um, just like anywhere else, lifestyle definitely does help um, for like acute care settings, right? Um, one of the things that 
we know it can help with our, for example, like making, there's been some good success in implementing, um, you know, plant-based menus at different hospital systems and leading to an increased control of sugar levels for diabetics who are admitted to the hospital. Um, We know that uh, like cardiac rehabilitation is one of the forefronts of lifestyle medicine and that it, um, that implementing lifestyle modifications during their stay in the hospital leads to decreased rates of readmission um, in the future. So, so there definitely is a lot of places where lifestyle can be integrated into like, you know, the hospital setting and can probably lead to better results. Um, And it really comes down to just having someone (laughs) be willing to like advocate for it and hopefully get Mm -hmm. it approved by the, you know, the administration there. So hopefully our conversation has stimulated some interest among our listeners in making some positive lifestyle changes of their own. Where would you recommend somebody go to get some uh, reliable information about the things we've been talking about and and maybe some advice about changes they could make in their own lives? There are some really good documentaries that you could watch um, about nutrition, uh, whole food, plant-based lifestyle. The three that I would recommend for that would be uh, Forks Over Knives. Forks Over Knives is available on a bunch of sites, Netflix, Amazon, but it's also free on their website to be streamed, right? If you go to forksoverknives.com, they can watch the the documentary. Um, A newer documentary that just came out that's a little shorter, that's also really good, is Plant Wise Documentary. That's available for free on the Advent Health website, adventhealth.com. For those who don't want to go to a different website and just go to YouTube for most of their videos, Plant Pure Nation is free for streaming on YouTube. And that one was also good. That's great. And I want to thank my guest, Dr. Hugo Ortega, for joining me today. Dr. Ortega is an expert in lifestyle medicine. Thank you so much for having me today. For more information about this program and to find past episodes, please visit medicine.hofstra.edu slash well said. You can also subscribe to our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Our listeners are welcome to send comments, suggestions, and questions to wellsaid at hofstra.edu. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ira Nash, and that's Well Said.